Merci. Hi everyone. Uh, thanks a lot for joining us for another episode of Digital Success Dialogue. I'm I'm going to avoid good morning, good afternoon, good evening because we have various people joining from various part of the kind of the world. Uh today we're going to have a very interesting discussion about how fintech open banking is going to evolve. Uh we have with us Mr. Bruno Macedo. Uh just to give you a small little context from about Bruno. Bruno is an experienced manager researcher and a fintech expert with a demonstrated experience leading digital process IT transformation and human augmentation across a range of sectors including fintech banking cybersecurity government and education he has more than 20 years of experience of leading digital department business units and shared service centers he is joining us from the beautiful country netherlands thanks a lot bruno for joining us today thank you so much it's, uh, it's an honor to be here thank you for the invitation shall i start awesome. <laughs> uh just give me a minute i will quickly uh, play a small little video introducing you in case people have because you have a long bio and then we will leave it to you and open the floor for you go ahead so guys bruno is going to help us really understand what this terminology for digitalization is how it's making an impact on fintech and open banking so here's to bruno and his interesting uh, walk through to the whole presentation thank you so much Sahit, again thank you everyone for this little bit and i hope i can get you as excited as i am with talking about this industry it's it's always uh, very interesting how we talk about uh, fintech these days uh, 10 years ago or 15 years ago talking about banking was not a, that exciting um and these days it's something that always gets everyone interested and everyone can contribute. So, I was already introduced. Uh thank you so much for that small introduction. Um I hope that I can talk a little bit with you guys about digital, this new reality that combines the digital and the physical in one and the impact for the fintech industry and also for the banking industry. Um Let's start uh quickly about me so uh, as as I was introduced I'm a speaker an advisor I also lecture about this and I like to think of myself as an outside thinker so therefore I always like to talk with everyone and and trade ideas and comments and so that I can bring it into the to the industry feel free to reach out in any given time I'm always open to trade some some comments ideas and to talk about this so let's start with saying the world has changed Uh, 20 years ago, if uh, we would uh, look at the banking industry, it would be something like uh, navigating in a calm, known weather uh, with with a ship. Your, if you were, your bank was a ship, you would probably be able to plan three years ahead and know what was going to happen in the market with the interest rates, so on and so forth. There would be some ways, but you know, in a sense, you would know more or less what happens, and you could plan it uh, in advance. With the uh, a uh, whole financial crisis and with the fintech revolution and things that have been happening now it's really hard to do those plannings with uh, such uh, an extended long, uh, long time you will then need uh, an experienced career and you need uh, also that chip and that those instruments at least that can bear you to the right place and it's very important that you have the right team to support you and you can react that's the same in the financial industry um The, the industry itself broke and you now have more than 12,000 fintechs and what used to be internal departments in the bank like the legal department or the payments department or the pensions department now are completely new industries with competitors with market entries so it's not easy for incumbent banks to keep being at the top of what they they, they were in the market but also it's not easy for new Uh, entrance in the market to compete what for us people that are interested in technology and and fintech it's super exciting because we get new things every day and if you notice what used to be something like wealth management now it's wealth tech bank managing and banking is bank tech everything is tech so we're mixing all this why because the whole 
uh, structured whole uh, uh, economic and social structure has been changing to that. Um, unfortunately, there was already this need to change and to be more digital and to be more ready to the, these new challenges. Um, we got the whole pandemic that made it even worse. So if we had already uh, what I used to call the perfect storm with different uh, areas and industries for merging into banking and creating new industries and new challenges. Now we have like an additional tornado on top of that uh, perfect storm. We have a health crisis, we have an economic crisis, we have to think about how we're going to do remote work. We have to think about how client empathy will react to the fact that they're not going to walk into our bank or companies anymore. So imagine all this, the perfect storm already from, from the, the revolution and the financial crisis and new technology hurdles, plus expectations and, and quick changes that have been happening now with the pandemic. So if we had the need to change and to be more digital before, now it's even faster, the, 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 the requirement and even faster the urgency to adapt our banks and, and companies to that. Um, as I said, so the world has been changing, the, the pandemic also changed, and the fact is that um, consumers and customers now uh, are used to services that they've been pampered with, like with the big techs, where everything is super, super fast and immersive, and they need quick responses, and they need to get on answers quickly and personally, and they need to be immersed and empowered. And we'll get there, there in a second. Uh, so how are fintech, uh, fintechs and, and fintech holding the, the storm in the middle of all this? Well, I like to believe that the way to hold up to that storm is through cognition and you have to go even beyond the just a, a simple digitization uh, on your processes. Uh, if you look at some uh, statistics that corroborate all, all this idea, 84% uh, of the, for example, of uh, banking customers in the US still visit their local branch, so that means there's a physical connection, but at the same time, millennials would consider banking with Google, for example, and drop their current uh, bank and also adopt something from, from Apple. So that means you, have, you start to have this combination of two worlds where people still like to go onto the branch to do their very um, important and high um, banking uh, service-heavy uh, requirements or services, but at the same time, they feel comfortable with going online and banking with technology companies and leave a little bit the, the financial and um, banking brand behind. So the world is really changing into this mix, hybrid, physical and digital. That's why we call it digital. Um, there's a lot of experiences. Marketing has been uh, approaching this for a while already. And how did, did this go? So how, how is this happening? Let me give you a, a quick look. Well. As I said, digital is basically the magic between the two worlds, in the, the, the being able to walk into a branch and being served or into a store and being served at the store, but have the same experience if I pick up the phone and I want to, or my smartphone, and I want to order the same service or product on my phone. The journey started basically um, from before the, 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 the 90s, but where we had like the, the, the physical experience, where we knew the bank advisor, we had one sales channel, we would walk into the bank, do our deposits, credits, take care of our loan. Then after the 2000s, we started to have some services and a lot of services expanding in, in banking portals, web portals, and uh, online uh, services on our, our phones. But the majority of those were different channels, even in social media. So there's a moment where companies and banks have been growing into different channels, but there's still the need or there was still the need to combine all those into an immersive experience. And that's basically what we're trying to get with digital. It's a holistic view of the customer where all channels are available and connected and provide you with the same experience, not only for the customer, but also for the bank. And you have to remember that banks have been sleeping for years, um, and pardon the, the, the word sleeping, is like they, they've been hanging over huge amounts of data and huge amounts of interesting uh, information that they haven't used it uh, fully. And now they're waking up to that. And studies and, and people around the industry know that if you actually are able to um, consolidate all those channels and, and, and make sure that that, that data, data and experience is uh, used, then you can actually move the frontier of um, 
return on investments and move the frontier of returns uh, actually uh, further with increased market share, lower cost income ratio, and improved risk profile. Basically, what we're saying is if you look at the customers that you have, if you explore the information and the and the way you behave with the customers, the if you provide them a better experience, you can actually take much more out of um, the whole uh, relationship with your customer. I'm not going to go into details, but just to tell you, to actually move into digital is not a question of just deciding to go there. You don't you don't go digital in in a couple of um, weeks or just because you decide uh, to go there. It actually entails a set of steps and processes that start from becoming a little bit more agile uh, to be able to respond to more immediate uh, uh, challenges. As I started in the whole presentation with that team in the boat that was uh, shaking a lot but also making sure that your infrastructure, besides the whole technical uh, approach on it, does respond to um, layers of information and data that you can gather it, can store it and analyze it, that you have um, an intelligent infrastructure layer that can actually get that data and provide you with some advice and, and forecast, uh, that your products and execution and security around that are all interconnected and respond to it. So I have some, really important information. I know how to handle it securely and I know how to act, predict and make my products and services uh, be better. And also on the feedback layers, uh, provide ways to actually get the feedback out of each interaction at each moment and in, 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 in each channel in a holistic view. So this is not simple and that's why you need to approach it in, 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 in a plant and most of the times and I'll get to there uh, with some partners. How do we go for it? Well, the first approach is, Sayed, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, Bruno, uh, I, I would actually want to spend a little more time on the last architecture that you had mentioned. Go ahead. That you yeah. have in the last slide. <laughs> and actually want uh, for, for the viewers, everyone joining in, to actually give, a, give, give an understanding of how exactly you mentioned about being agile. Uh, you mentioned about uh, how to adapt and take those feedbacks continuously yes. when we are trying to actually move to the digital. Now, give me, give us some examples or something that you had an experience working for people both who have been in the legacy system for a good amount of time and people who are starting it fresh. Uh, how did actually that happen? Yeah, absolutely. So the, the architecture that you see here is more for managers. So it's more under the perspective on how to use the data. But if you would do a transversal um, architecture layer for most of your colleagues that are more uh, well, the techies, they would probably understand it as in the very low end, you would have probably a data warehouse instead of the normal SQL reporting system. So basically, most banks have, for example, transactions and, and, and a set of transactions with values, with um, uh, patterns on the transactions, with, with information about the, the time when the transaction occurred, the medium and the average and uh, the, the type of consumers and, and, and how, what do they buy. Now, imagine that I walk in your bank and that, that's the example I wanted to give you. And I tell you, OK, you already have that information. You just need the. the the your customers to allow you to use it to provide some intelligent uh, response and let's imagine that i'm um i allow my bank to do that and then i'm mm -hmm. thinking on having a baby and my bank notices that i'm buying baby clothing and i'm buying a a bigger car and then okay the bank goes he's having a baby that it, it, it looks like he's preparing to have a baby and in my phone I get a response saying, uh, Bruno, by the way, if uh, we noticed that you're buying baby stuff, uh, we have a special loan uh, for a bigger house, or you could actually save on your insurance because the API is behind the whole bank and, and their partners are actually telling the partners, look, there's this person with this uh, household and uh, this is the structure. Do you have a better insurance for him, for example? And the insurance company can actually mm -hmm. say, yes, you can offer him a, a better insurance. Um, uh, with this, what we call uh, invisible banking, and to get there, uh, it's hard with legacy systems because they don't have the data warehouse capacity or the cloud capacity or the business, the um, competitive and business intelligence capacity to provide you those forecasts. And okay, looking at the infrastructure, infrastructure, for example, if you see information and data where you have the data warehouse, advanced analytics systems, and big data systems, that's just a way to gather and prepare your data. Then you would get, for example, cognitive uh, tools from, 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 from cloud services to tell you mm -hmm. where exactly would you get or an advanced monitoring uh, platform that would tell you, oh, wait, uh, Bruno is actually not by having any baby because he's not even married. So this is awkward or he's not even um, together with anyone. This might be fraud or something like that. You can actually trigger something. Um, okay. Let's imagine if you have that data, 
you have to connect it to your product. So you can't mm -hmm. wait. If you, if you have a decision that says, look, we need to be able to create a product on our bank, a special loan for people this way, you can't wait then after one year or something to create a product. You need the infrastructure, the software to be able to create a special loan with a special rate, mo okay. mostly on apply with some four eyes principle, six eyes principle, but it needs to be flexible. It needs to act in, a, in an agile way. Also, um, the interaction. So if Bruno responds on the app or on social media, or if he complains that the loan is not as good or something like that, you need mm -hmm. also the capacity to respond to it. Um, sometimes okay. it, it would be another interesting uh, um, meeting. Sometimes we talk about how software itself and the development of software uh, needs to be ready to do this type of recycling and adapt to quickly adapt to these to these challenges. I hope that's okay. I answered it. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so basically, as a client, I want my as I told you, I want my app uh, and my bank to respond to me in a cognitive way. It would. Basically, I want my app to respond like if it was somebody that I would be talking at the bank. If I would be talking with my advisor, I want the, the app to more or less act in the same way, telling me, look, you have a special loan, as I said, or you can just uh, lower your costs, put new windows on your house and save some money, something like that. Um, and this implies something that goes uh, then into the whole world of services behind it. How can banks, besides the architecture, implement all this? There's um, a huge amount of technologies and services and possibilities that we can take advantage of. And those rely on the same amount or the same size as, as I told you for uh, the increasing number of industries and the increasing number of um, fintech related uh, industries that we can, we can use. We can go from artificial intelligence to uh, a localized based social network industry. This is a whole universe uh, that we can explore with partners and, and, and colleagues. What's important is that not only you prepare your bank and your, your uh, company to respond to that, but also you understand that you're providing the customer, the consumer, um, what he's been looking for in the financial industry that he already has from the big techs, which is basically the fact that you know me, so you don't ask me questions about something that you should know based on my information. Don't tell me to put my pay slip if you know uh, if you get my salary on, on my bank account, you're engaging. You ask me if I like this or if I'm interested in that, and I, you actually listen to, to what I uh, have to say back uh, so you hear me. Uh, you empower me. I can take a decision to make a loan and, 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 and how much do I want it in how much times or an investment on my phone and, and, and my solution that you provide me on that channel. And, and at the very end, I get delighted because it's not just a one-to-one, -one very, uh, very stuck in the... Uh, obscure relationship it's a the relationship that even the language in these days it's really different and more personal so this is just to give you an idea uh, that it's not something simple that you do overnight it does require uh, a little bit uh, you can't do this alone it's, it's not easy um, uh, even if you're a big bank it does uh, require for you to expand on or your apis the connections that you have and actually do some smart collaborations. There's a lot of interesting companies out there in those small niche markets that do specialized, uh, uh, interesting things. And if you really want to compete and have something at the very level of big techs, but also at the uh, high level of banking and finance uh, uh, quality level, uh, service, you really need to search for nice collaborations and, and have your colleagues. So what is the result of all this? Uh, can I give you some examples? And with this, I'm, I hope that I'll, I'll, I'll finish up my presentation soon. Is The result is that online and at the branch for the banking industry, you would have a similar experience. And some banks are already doing that. So if I log in on my banking portal and I want to check for a loan and I want to talk with somebody, I must have the possibility to talk with an advisor the same way that I would have the same possibility to talk with that advisor at the, the branch. Um, I also want my uh, visual um, experience in the, the portal to be of a similar experience at the branch. If at the branch I have some uh, section where I can talk with a person on a certain level, I want that same experience and service online. The other way around, if I get to the branch, the branch also has to understand that I can't just walk in the branch anymore and spend the whole morning to talk with somebody to take care of something that probably could take 
a few minutes online. The branch has to respond to that. So a lot of banks are actually starting some uh, challenge tests or even uh, already implemented uh, branches that are smart branches that actually uh, respond to your daily necessities. They are, besides being a bank, they actually uh, work with like a coffee area, uh, a smart ATM that can respond to whatever you need. Uh, there's like a place where you can actually work. So some banks actually have um, sports centers for your kids. You can have a branch at the branch uh, and then you get a different experience and you get more um, inclined to do the work there, but you don't feel like it's something completely separated from what you could do online in a different place. So end result, all interactions are powered by the hyper-connected data across multi-platforms and gives you this intelligent context aware uh, experience where you feel that you're empowered and you, with this you can you don't get disrupted you actually get more advantages from working with the bank and the bank actually gets your life easier it's nice so how does it look like in the real life well i'm going to pass you quickly and with this i'm going to end in italy for example Kebanka has started like a digital bank where you could just walk in and with your phone, you have the, uh, somebody that you can ask for questions, but with your phone, like you would do it at home or something, you get a, like a very automated service, uh, which gives you a quick experience. You don't have almost a waiting time, but if you need any additional help, you can always reach for a human uh, interaction, but you can actually take care of your business and, and banking services really quick. At Kaisha Bank, for example, um, you you act, they created uh, uh, an area where you could uh, actually do some workshops or some some uh, IT uh, gatherings with your colleagues, and uh, you could just work there, even study and even play there in a, while you're doing uh, some new creations, some new companies, uh, and and interact with the bank, which is something really 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 cool and out of the ordinary. One of my favorites, Virgin Bank, actually gives you the experience to be on a, on a plane while you are at the bank branch and uh, also you could uh, have coffee and um, do some tv game consoles free wi-fi newspapers so that's literally not the typical experience that you would expect from a bank you have really really new uh, um, new type of services for example you have a bowling alley in the bank and i think that's something that i would not expect in the bank at all so it is uh, an amazing new world. Amazon has uh, uh, um, another experience in fully integrated with the bank where you can walk in, do your grocery, walk out, and basically uh, um, it's, it's all intelligent. There's a lot of uh, interesting technology products. It's near field. You don't even have to do most of the, st the, the typical things that you would do in the supermarket, all technology empowered and all adapted to you. What am I trying to say with all this is that there's a lot in digital. There's a lot that you can gain. There's a lot that consumers are expecting from your financial services and from your industry. There's a lot of market share for banks, for software industries, and for consumers itself to, to gain with this. But to go digital, you need to do some big steps. One is to change your mindset. Uh, the other one is to, to be safe. And last but not least let me just go back there a second um you need to uh, set up your ecosystem and, and and connect to to other people and rehearse those digital journeys with with your that your customers are going to experience i hope that this is not too much to kill you with in 20 minutes but i just wanted to give you the idea that it's really really an amazing industry and it's it's really exciting to to be working on on this um Syed, i hope i didn't kill you too much with all this uh, awesome. Uh, to be honest, it, it was great listening to you and, and I have a lot of questions to be asked and I'm sure some people would ask it. So we will just quickly move back to, yeah, wonderful. Uh, so Bruno, uh, to start with, I would, I would really want to understand, uh, and my first question primarily goes talking about the isolation economy, which I think digital is a byproduct of and where we are currently living in, wherein we actually want everything to be done over the phone and we actually want less to step out. Uh, keeping aside the unfortunate pandemic but yeah this is what uh, our behavior was heading towards and how do you think uh, a bank a bank which which primarily will want to get started who do you think he should look at who could be their early adopters uh, to start with that that's that's a that's a very interesting question so i would i would answer you a couple of months ago that they 
probably should start with the millennials and, and the, the, the newer generations that are more inclined and used to work with the big techs, the, the ones that have been pampered by the Amazons and the Apples of this world. With the pandemic, what we saw is that um, older generations have been forced to well to start using mostly digital channels because they can't they're not allowed to to use other channels, even fiduciary money. Um, so basically, now what I would probably advise banks to do is not only test the uh, physical the digital journeys from some younger generations, but also we imagine how somebody older with some some more difficulty in understanding the whole concept of technology would interact with it i still get phone calls and and, and conversations with um customers from banks that say how am i going to react to somebody that only knows how to use the phone which is really hard they're, they're used to having an advisor uh so i would say uh it's an, it's an extra hurdle so they have to probably reimagine the whole branch in a way that it's safe for human contact but at the same time it's more digital so actually it, it's it's a great question i would say now they have to imagine that both targets both groups but okay. probably different yeah too. right uh we've been hearing about branchless banking wherein we said that the branchless banking will primarily have millennials accepting the online banking and you will still have this senior citizens coming in so you need initially might not actually have it but as far as i right now see that it, 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 it's it's going to be a mix of both people want to come sometimes some part of it and some still don't want to go uh, primarily my second question which goes out to you is is keeping in mind that currently a lot of banks are becoming very cost effective uh, uh keeping and a lot of them have a lot of npas in this part of the country we had some issues regarding npas coming across and that's where a bank somehow sometimes struggle to become profit Uh, a, yeah. a recent survey told, uh, uh, showed us that digital could be one of the great ways to actually open a lot more sales revenue. Any anything that you particularly saw uh, being adopted by some of the banks, and they've actually made a lot of money, or, or they did make an impact in their overall revenue. Yeah, absolutely. So there's 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 this um, dual challenge. So there's uh, in Europe, for example, there's GDPR about privacy and, and data privacy with the amount of data that is shared. That kind of constrains you uh, for for great reasons. That kind of constrains you in in going uh, further in some integration with APIs and data interchange. On the other hand, open APIs or open finance, because open banking itself uh, it's just limited to banking, but open finance goes across the industry. I see a lot uh, that can be made across open finance, and that's where banks can actually get a, a big return on investment. Um, I, I gave you the the the, the example while during the presentation. So if I want to do some loan, for example. If my bank mm -hmm. already has APIs and it's interconnected to my insurance company, to some credit or even real estate, my loan journey is basically searching the market for the best price to get a loan for a certain uh, amount that I need for a house. And if the bank can actually help me out by using my di my data, um, and if I get an experience, uh, because I will probably want to walk into a branch to talk about the loan, I'm, I doubt that I'll do it from my computer. If that experience can be as smart at the branch as it would be on the phone, imagine that I walk in the branch and somebody there already knows whatever he needs to, to know to provide me a quick, swift answer with some some uh, huge amount of uh, safety and, and what he's saying in the device. That's huge, and banks can make a lot out of it. And, and I'm pretty sure people, especially millennials, will definitely choose for uh, services that make their life easier, but at the same time empower them and, and, and give them some financial knowledge. In the way that otherwise they would have to spend hours in the bank. Awesome. So, so, so if if I if I understand correctly, is that primarily you're thinking of actually mixing a lot of financial products, and then that really banks becomes the core of uh, all the kind of problems or all kind of products which can be offered to this kind of guy. Yeah. So in India, primarily the, 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 there's there's one of the largest banks uh, which primarily is looking at coming across and becoming consolidated in terms of e-commerce. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you think digital can be a great way to have that? Uh, A bridge between the online commerce, the banking. Currently, this this sit apart. You have Amazon's of the world trying to just use banking. You think the banks will become the e-commerce hub, and then you think something in that sort, any anything in that direction? Absolutely. So imagine this. Imagine that you have, especially in India, that you have a close connection to your uh, uh, small merchants around your neighborhood or around your your town. Uh, they know you, mm -hmm. and, and they trust you because they know that you do the shopping there every day. And you probably don't have any problem walking in there one day and uh, ordering more than usual, because there's a mm -hmm. trust built uh, over years. With some cognitive data and and, and using the the fact that you paid um, 
that you always paid your bills, uh, uh, that can create a lot of new businesses for your merchant. And your merchant okay. trusts people easy in an easier way because the bank tells them, look, don't worry about it. He's, he's actually a nice person. He keeps uh, uh, paying every time. Also can actually advise them to say, look, you've been opening from nine to five, but we noticed that most of the people just buy your product after five or something. So for example, imagine the bicycle merchant that sells bicycles. And due to the bank knows the, uh, from the, the, the payments uh, transactions and then from analyzing the data that most of the people actually want to buy bicycles during a certain period of time, during a certain period of hours, and they cycle at night, for example. Then it probably doesn't make sense that you open in the morning. It, it, the bank can actually advise you to open your shop later in the evening to help them out or on the weekends. And right. there's a lot of behavioral technology that can actually help you. And from the consumer side, there's also great if you can actually participate and tell the bank, look, I'm missing an, an open shop that I can take my bike on the weekend because everything is closed and I actually just want to bike and do sports on the weekend. Um, so from fraud management, from behavioral uh, approach, from that physical to digital um, advice experience, there's really a lot that banks when they are connected through data to, to other partners and merchants, there's really a lot that can be gained and a lot that can be made. And again, I'm, I'm never talking, but companies like yours, uh, companies that actually do software development and, 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 and consultancy do play a big role here because you're the best ones to advise on how to build those, um, those, those journeys or at least to how to analyze them. So um, it goes without saying that there's, a, there's an important role there for software companies. Uh, absolutely, a lot of times, uh, a lot of us, actually do that part wherein we actually go to the market and understand what the customers are actually looking after. And then we fortunately have that liberty of going and telling that to the top brackets sitting in various banks. Uh, exactly. An interesting point which you mentioned right now is, is, is all about the customer experience. If I, if I understand that, wherein you're talking about bikes, which, which allows people to actually help what they're doing and then actually adopting your business model as per your consumer behavior. The second thing which often comes with customer behavior in terms of understanding them deeply is security. Uh, yeah. how, how do you think that's going to be handled with digital? Uh, uh, do you have anything specific in mind to handle that security part of in the digital? It's one of the biggest challenges. I usually say there's like three big challenges around the whole digital approach. One is human, and, and, and it's not easy to get somebody that knows technology and banking, the, the fintechers as ourselves. It's not easy. We don't have yet uh, a long experience of universities and courses on fintech. So... The second one is about uh, regulation and, and it's the legal approach, which is also hard, but definitely security is one of the biggest. We're talking about that amount of information and data that was lying uh, on the banks, uh, probably in the basement in some files in a, in a nice server. And now we want to open mm -hmm. it up to be used, um, well, for good, for, for businesses and, and to, to empower people. But of course, mm -hmm. um, we will probably use it with cloud technologies, but somebody with mean intentions has the same capacity to probably try to get that data and use it in the wrongest way possible. So it's a huge mm -hmm. challenge. And then with this, I don't want to say that we shouldn't do it, but you're right when you're asked, okay, how to do this? It, every step of the way, I would say, if possible, combine the best of the millennial experience in banks in um, due diligence when taking actions with mm -hmm. the best of agile approach from the big tech. So yeah, look at the data, be open to how to pick up that data, but still use the toll gates and the security uh, uh, defense and the uh, risk um, adverse approach that banks have. It's not easy, but then again, that's where a lot of consultancy and a lot of uh, interaction is needed because we're talking about our financial information and our financial life, and that has a huge impact. So it cannot just be the secured uh, in a simple way. And there's a whole industry and science around it on cybersecurity for banking or vendor management with risk at, uh, risk management for banking. So it's it's a really great question, Sayed. Awesome. Uh, coming and uh, now we leave the FinTech aside, let's talk about a little bit about open banking. That's another area that actually is buzzing and people are, are, are talking a lot about it. I really wanted to understand one thing. Uh, do you think the current, uh, often people say that open banking will change the internal way of working inside the bank. If people want to enter into the open banking culture, do you think the organization structure would, would be a reject which you think due to open banking being becoming the primary focus of a bank tomorrow? Anything uh, you think in the organizational part of it? Yeah, absolutely. So um, data will be the focus of banks. Will, the banks will most probably 
be the, 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 the place where we store our data and we give them besides our financial uh, um, capacity or wealth, we're going to give them the, the, the probably the access or the, the given the key to access to our data and because it's going to become more and more important by, by day. And we need banks to adapt to that um, human approach in their employees in the way that they work. You cannot continue to have a non-agile approach when, on, on how banks work and talk about open banking APIs and, and providing data or uh, in a more technical terms, do cycles of CI CDs in two weeks or something like that, cost of development. Right. And so you need a big cultural change. And mm -hmm. that cultural change needs to somehow keep the best of the, the banking industry and combine it with the best of the, the technology industry, the best of the regulator industry, which is not easy also, and it's yeah. heavily, super heavy for banks, and also the best of being ready for something that might come in the future. I usually tell a fintecher is it's a new uh, uh, type of professional because it, it actually needs to know a little bit about technology, a little bit about banking, a little bit about regulation, but still be ready to learn something new tomorrow because our, our life is changing every day and the banks need to adapt to that reality. And that's not going to be easy, but if banks are able to provide initiatives like innov innovation centers or um, uh, something like challenger, challenger uh, projects and ideas to connect to fintechs to get to get some information or actually help. There's a lot to gain and there's a lot to be to 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 be shifted and uh, and to make in the future. I'm, I'm imagining the bank of the future, if we can call it, in the next years. It's going to be completely different from the the from what we know these days uh, in size in in. in in morphology and, and, and how it, 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 it works because it really needs to shift. Uh, if we want to keep being, let's say, digitally significant, because there's other types of banks for, for private banking that they might still exist with other type of approaches that don't, doesn't get that affected for now with this type of, of revolution. Right, when, when you say you have to be digitally uh, significant for the future, uh, let's also a little bit touch upon the fact that how will the central banks play the role? Right now, central banks have that liberty to actually hold all the kind of regulations they dictated to the banks. Uh, I, I, I somehow feel that, uh, do you think they'll become banks which will have the APIs to, with them, with open banking in picture? They'll regulate primarily who's going to see what, who's going to not see what. Do you think that's, that's the structure of a central bank in future? Yes. I, I Allow me to, to, make, uh, to be a little bit less serious around this. I usually tell that... Uh, in, in, a, in a joke sense, I usually tell that central banks have been so envy of fintech, they just started to be fintechs themselves because they didn't used to come into conferences or speak at conferences. Now you see a lot of representatives from, from, from central banks talking how they innovate and how they have open banking and open finance, which is great. But uh, so I make fun of it in the best way possible, saying, hey, nice that you guys want to join us. Um, but they're actually taking, some of them are actually taking huge leads on that. The, the Brazilian central bank, it's impressive. They just started a whole new initiative for open finance. And that's leading the, the, the whole country in regulation and, and, and technology and so on, which usually would be something that you would be expecting coming from a big bank and not exactly from the regulator or the central bank. So in, in, the, in the European Union, there's, um, there's been a mix, but it's actually taking lead again in, in, in the central banks. Um, in not only providing uh, the, the regulation, but also providing some new um, uh, technology or advice in consultancy in, in, in new aspects and new ways of services. The PSD2 is, is a nice, is a nice uh, approach on how the central bank was involved. And I believe that soon enough, we will see central banks, as you said, and you said it well, taking a way more prominent role, not only uh, um, in trying to get everything together, but also advising and being a center of advise, uh, 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 advisory for how to proceed in the future, which is something really, really great to see. Of course, they have different, um, well, different engines and different speeds than we do, uh, in, especially in the software industry. Uh, but it's been remarkable the the, the effort that they're making. Uh, let's see how it goes in in the, in the next years. But I would say it, it's it's a great partner to have next to and, and also it's a great uh, aspect of the financial life of each country to take a well a close look on, on, on what's going on uh, for example a lot yeah. to something uh, for example the sandbox experience that the, every country is now creating and then trying to make it international right. it's, it's, I 
Yeah, I was actually coming to the sandbox itself. That glad you picked it up. So uh, my question uh, to you is primarily with sandboxing, and uh, fortunately in this part of the country also we're seeing a lot of people actually utilizing it to the fullest. Uh, off the shelf product will become common, wherein uh, people would like to understand they take one thing from one bank or they take one thing from one one kind of uh, financial provider, and then create a mix of it which might only suit Bruno versus not might not suit someone like Syed because it's his behavior, it's his way of yeah. living lifestyle. that i think is becoming common uh, you've seen anything of that sort being 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 developed anything you've watched very closely yeah there's there's a lot of sandbox experiences i i i always try not to speak too much about sandbox because every day there's something coming out and i don't, don't want to take the risk of saying something that changed yesterday but it's it's impressive so uh, there were some sandbox uh, initiatives in in local countries uh, for the last 10 years then it changed for hubs dubai hub or or the amsterdam hub uh, and and then the berlin hub for some sandbox experiences and now we see international sandbox experiences throughout hubs so uh, sandboxes that are actually made for companies in india for example to test out their software to be implemented in europe which is great and you would save a lot of money as a company just to put yourself in a sandbox but also for companies that are just starting and they just need to uh well just need to save some time and to creating something that is already compliant by design sandboxes are very important there and and governments have been playing a really great role there helping out companies to to test out their software so um every day we see new initiatives with with international sandboxes we see also new isos for financial schemas and so on to make things more standard uh i really think it's a great initiative and i think it's it's one um aspect that i would advise every fintech out there doesn't matter how in which stage to at least take a look because they could save them a lot of money and a lot of a lot of headaches uh because you could just become compliant by design and by the time you actually apply for a license or something most of the times the regulator already knows you and makes things so easy and so faster to be approved so it is definitely something to take into account awesome while i was just having an understanding and you're talking about regulation uh, somehow uh, a year from now when the world was talking all about blockchain uh, unfortunately we have a, a, a viewer already commenting and asking you this question is primarily the cryptocurrency where where is that bubble heading is that was that really a bubble or do you think that just that it has it has it has taken a leap in terms of implementation and is going to come back very hard soon uh, how do you think the world of crypto evolving in your future it's it's one of the 1 million questions i've been working with blockchain since 2012 so it was pretty much not known yet so it's from 2008 the the, the paper and in 2012 we looked at it mostly as an interesting approach for um a decentralized way to 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 work things so basically from identity to passports to even to currency what i always say is that um most of the initiatives that i see on on cryptocurrencies have been private uh corporate way of uh, or private corporate uh, experiences for for crypto so we always an interest on making profit for the company that's developing them so it's always there's always a, a big level of volatility there unless governments really start to adopt them uh, uh, per se and here's where the things get a little bit tricky if from one side you can see a lot of articles stating that yeah sure we're going to have a Uh, cryptocurrency for Europe and uh, with Germany already leading in there there's a lot in in Asia st- starting to build up it would give you the sense that okay this sounds like i can invest something on here and i can start working with it uh, on the other hand there's a lot of still uh, details that haven't been cleared out that can actually create some sense of of defense it's really a hard market to do some some forecast one of the 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 the, the hypothesis for example is that there's not a lot of people arguing about the algo from 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 the, the the blockchain itself how it's calculated and how it can it be break and if it's broken how can you actually uh fix it or make sure that nobody that nobody actually uses it in the wrong way there's been some experiences and some attempts to use the uh chains in a more private and more obscure way than actually the the whole initial uh, uh, idea that to make it open and known for everyone So I would mm-hmm. definitely say cryptos are here to stay. It's hard for me to under, to to imagine that they're not that they're going away because they they make life easier for a lot of people. And they're actually special interesting for uh safeguarding value. There's some currents of sorts and some current of uh, scholars that believe that fiduciary money if it ceases to exist 
it gives too much power to to central governments. So cryptos are there to safeguard some uh, well s some of your uh, financial assets. Um, but I, I I dare to say yes, they're here to stay. There's still a lot of volatility you saw with uh, Bitcoin these these last weeks, right. which actually it's not was not the intention at all at the beginning. The intention was that it would be more stable than a normal mm -hmm. currency, and it's right. not. So. Uh, yeah, if I knew the, the the answer to that question, probably I would be rich in a couple of days. But uh, still, it's they're here to stay. Uh, it's an interesting area. Technology, technology speaking, it's it's really interesting, and and I think and I hope that the technology of blockchains and related technologies will actually get more mature, and then we can actually use it for way more way more uh, uh, different industries and, and aspects. Awesome. Uh, uh, one thing which I, I actually want to actually go deep and uh, keeping aside, we've spoken about uh, how exactly digitalization is going to evolve. One thing is the open banking. The second thing is all about innovation. Printech, printechs have been known for innovation. Now, uh, I really wanted to understand if you've seen anything in particular because last six odd months across the globe has been challenging uh, for multiple industries. You might have seen someone really doing something really out of the box. Any example, anything that you would like to share uh, with, with the viewers here today? Yeah, I so in innovation, and I must say that um, there's a lot of uh, initiatives from big banks trying to make some some uh, challenging labs or challengers to try new technologies. Uh, I would start before giving you the perfect example. I would start by saying, always do an evaluation on vendors and 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 the way you want to innovate. If it's a small innovation, you can do a small lab. If it's a big innovation, maybe you would, you need some big vendor management and do some big evaluation before you actually start to, to take it on. This would be a whole new meeting that we could do, a whole new webinar around it. But I saw, for example, a, a bank that actually translated all of its processes into uh, smart contracts and putting them in, into uh, their own internal chain, which was the result is that the costs to process anything in the bank are uh, super low, like they're very uh, minimum. Uh, but also the human, uh, well, the human necessity, it's also minimum. So that was strange to see a bank that say, I can work with 12 people and still serve thousands of people because all of my processes in the bank have been put it in the, into a smart contract and in the chain. So if, if trigger one happens, it gets processed in a way and I can actually sell a whole corporate license in my bank for less than 60 euros a year and still make a lot of profit. To me, that was okay. Wow, regulation-wise, that probably it's amazing. Regulators will probably love it. There's no human touching it, so once it works, it's fine. But you need to understand the uh, well, probably the code behind the the the, um, the smart contracts. On the other hand, it I, I still don't even know the, the the impact in the whole banking industry if we st just start to auto make everything automatic and 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 and, and cognitive. But for me, that was a huge leap in innovation, probably five ten years ahead of our time. It's it's strange that I would just do something and just ten minutes later there's an agreement smart contract that okay. It's um, yes, yes, it's actually so uh, one of the things that for us have been an experience working for fintech now roughly for more than a decade now has been the customer onboarding. Often, often a lot of the banks or insurance players or also a lot of financial products because of the regulations and everything has been one of the areas that they are still trying to solve as to how do you minimize customer touch points, make the onboarding experience a lot better. I think if people are actually innovating in that, then I think the innovation is going to stay for far longer than they actually apprehend. Yeah. Uh, if, if you touch, for example, open accounting, it's, uh, that's usually one of the biggest hurdles for small uh, uh, SMEs, for small and medium companies. If I want to ask for a loan to start my company, probably these days the bank will take a couple of weeks and ask me all sorts of documents and it's super um, evasive for me, so it's it's, it's very uh, it gets to the to, to more questions and, and gets me very uncomfortable uh, to provide the bank that amount of information and details. Probably I don't even have the time or money to, to start with, but I do need that loan. And um, so with these innovations, for example, in open accounting, I can just provide an API that the bank connects to my company, gets uh, partial data that it's enough with what they need to make an assessment of my risk and do the due diligences and then the, and the risk assessment. And that is actually um, completely disruptive. I can get a loan uh, quickly if, if the bank has access to that information in probably an hour or five minutes versus having to provide paperwork and so on and walking into the bank and talking to an advisor. I can imagine that for, for the short, medium uh, uh, range when these things start to really become 
in practice, it's going to have a huge impact in the banking industry. It's going to be tremendous. Absolutely. So, Bruno, uh, for a couple of minutes, I'm going to give you a very interesting part. I'm going to make you the banking king of the world, and you're going to give, I'm going to ask you this question: Is that uh, what's the one thing that you're going to undo in the banking industry, and why? What, what one thing you really hate, and or you do not want? Actually, hate is a bad word, but something that you would want to revisit and do. Press the undo yeah. button. Okay, I, I've been an immigrant, so I've been around the world, and and one of the things that always bothers me is that there's no and you you put it out out there when i'm onboarding there's always this due diligence that it it doesn't matter if i go from the netherlands to germany which is right next door it looks like i'm going into a completely new world and i need to go and, and undergo this huge process to get a bank account i need a house to get a bank account but i need a bank account to get a house and uh so on and so forth in each new country but once i have that bank account if I leave the country, there's no problem. So it's like it's it's a huge hurdle to get in, but then it's you can just stay. Even if you leave the country, you can just stay there. So I would say one of the things that I would probably undo in the banking industry, or at least change it, is the way you actually do due diligence. Banks know each other. It's not it's not like they haven't talked with each other. And governments know each other. So it would be really good if they could just make things a little bit more easier in especially in big spaces like europe or india or so on where you could actually open a bank account without having to i don't know provide a, a huge amount of data that is probably unnecessary due to the risk also of what you're doing maybe they could just start with a limited bank account okay you can just deposit money and take out money for small services and, and then we will do your due diligence due to time so but especially that part i would definitely uh change it i would create a banking union somehow for big spaces, that would make. Awesome. Yeah, I, I think we did. We did meet someone back in uh, London uh, a year back, and and he was trying to actually solve it primarily for the students, wherein they actually move out and actually study from different countries, have a huge hassle uh, to open banks, and then they move from one country to another, either for studies or even, for example, for any kind of internship or some kind of exchange programs. And I think that that's one of the. So I, I recall the conversation I had with him. That you know, now the remote work. So now if you go and you want to do some work in some different country. So if you go to India, to Canada, for example, imagine that you want to work there for a year with those special visas. Then you probably exactly. will tell you, like, I'm sorry, you're just in a hotel or just in a rented house. We have to pay you back to India, not here. Although you would have to still uh, use the money and your daily lives there. And th this is probably one of the challenges that we don't talk too much but digital nomads and digital work it's all nice and well and doing remote work but if you have those hurdles it actually starts to become a little bit more different although companies like uh, revolut and others are actually trying to make that thing a little bit more easier but it's still a big hurdle for everyone as you said i agree absolutely uh so uh, bruno i think we're done and there's a last little question which i'll ask you is uh, primarily for something that viewers would actually how do they actually learn a lot about a domain that you really like, that's fintech, or anything that you recommend in terms of books, podcasts, which everyone can go back and listen to? Yeah, so, well, apart from myself, guys, I'm an online influencer. Of course, I have needed to do some publicity to myself. So feel free to connect, as I said in the beginning, and I'm, I'm always open to, to discuss it. I, I like the Breaking Banks uh, podcast. It's, it's uh, very interesting, made by top uh, industry influencers and experts. And, and apart from that, I would definitely say if you're a professional in this area, if you do have some time, do take the time to see um, what's published by the, the big central regulators from the big economical areas in the European mm -hmm. Union, in the US. I know sometimes it, it, it seems a little bit too serious and the, and the publications seem a little bit too serious, but most of the times that's where the, the, the big um next challenges that you can solve for your company so i would definitely advise to see the european union publications the uh, the and, and breaking banks in, in terms of podcasts and don't well and reach out for friends and, and, and colleagues of course awesome thanks a lot bruno for joining us i think i i i think there are two major takeaways for us which i would reiterate is primarily how it's important for banks to become agile in order to be so-called digitally significant in future. The second definitely is becoming cost effective. You mentioned about a great example of how they are ready to serve thousands of customers with a very limited number of employees. That's the way forward. And definitely is that they're going to create an, an ecosystem which will allow people to have products which are very specific to them. 
So I think these were the basic learnings that we had for today. And it was really great hearing from you. Thanks a lot for joining us for the day. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure to be here and I really appreciate it. I wish you all the best. Thank you for the energy and have a great time. See you, See you soon. Awesome. Take care. I'll just quickly play a small little video. Uh, here's, here's another video, a small little reiteration of uh, who Bruno is and how he's actually making an impact to the world. Thanks a lot, guys, for joining us. Uh, so uh, it's a bye from us. Hope you have a great weekend. And I think uh, there are already comments, Bruno, by the way, that people are sending in connection requests to you. So hope you have some good communi uh, communication from your own. Thanks a lot for joining us for the day. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Bye-bye.